Hello, everybody from Las Vegas, Nevada, where I am kicking off my Swing State Tour, and I cannot do it without you, especially Cassie Rice and her family who are putting me up for the week. I've got some real exciting plans and ideas to try to get out the vote here in Nevada and other Swing States, and that'll all get underway today, starting today. But on the show today, I've got the great Steve Bennon, who is one of my favorite authors and political writers. His new book is as good as his last one. So, so important. It's called Ministry of Truth. Truth, democracy, reality, and the Republicans' war on the recent past. If you want to skip ahead from news and clips to listen to that right now, it begins at 25 minutes. Also, just want to mention here at the top that I will be hosting a watch party for tomorrow night's debate. It's going to be very, very important, exciting, and I will be hosting a watch party for all paid subscribers. You should be getting an email, a link to that like you do every week for the Hangout. I hope to see you tomorrow night. The debate is set to be 90 minutes on ABC News. It starts at 9 p.m., so I think I'll kick off the watch party about 8.30, but look for that email if you are a paid subscriber. Looking forward to seeing you then. But now it's time to get to your headlines and sound bites. I'm still doing a full show, even though I'm out here in Nevada in the makeshift studio in a bedroom at Cassie's house. Very, very happy to be here. And now it's time to do what we do every day, give you the news and sound bites. Let's start with the fact that it's hot here in Las Vegas and California, and there are wildfires, raging wildfires in both California and Nevada have led to mandatory evacuations of thousands of homes, forecasters warning of rain record heat in the West for the next few days, and that's when I'll be out here knocking on doors and hopefully standing on a corner holding signs. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. There are 14 active wildfires currently burning across California. One so intense it's created its own weather pattern, apparently, so that's terrible. But let me move away from weather and to the Middle East, where a gunman killed three Israelis at a border crossing between Jordan and Israeli-occupied West Bank, according to the Israeli military. The Israeli military struck two school compounds that are turned shelters in Gaza. The military said that Hamas was using them as a base, of course. The Israeli military also appeared to withdraw from Janin, which is a city in the occupied West Bank, after a 10-day raid that killed dozens of people and damaged homes, businesses, and infrastructure. Elsewhere in the West Bank, you may have heard about this tragic shooting of a 26-year-old American woman who was protesting Israeli settlements there, and activists said Israeli soldiers had shot her. The family of this woman have demanded an independent investigation, saying that Israel could not investigate her death in partial. It's a huge story, a terrible story. And in a separate incident, a 13-year-old Palestinian girl was also fatally shot, which is part of the rising toll of West Bank violence during the war in Gaza. Of course, the West Bank separate from Gaza. But terrible news from the Middle East, as usual. The Justice Department accused a Pakistani citizen of plotting to attack a Jewish center in Brooklyn, New York, on or near the October 7th anniversary of the Hamas attacks on Israel. So glad that they caught that person. Iran has sent short-range missiles to Russia, according to U.S. and European officials. Iran denied providing the weapons. And if you think shit is bad here in America, the Venezuelan opposition candidate Edmundo Gonzalez, who's widely considered to have won July's disputed presidential election has fled the country. He was facing an arrest warrant. I hope we never get to that bad. Developments on the school shooter in Georgia, of course, his father has been arrested for giving him the gun as being charged with second degree murder. And the mother of the boy who fatally shot four people at his Georgia high school last week told relatives that she had gone to warn the school of an emergency on the morning of the attack, according to her sister. So that's a pretty crazy development, but I'm glad that his father is being held responsible. He's 14 and his dad gave him an AR-15 and he had issues not good and apparently not legal. Let's go to some of the political stories about the campaign. The judge overseeing the disgraced former president's Manhattan criminal case postponed his sentencing until after election day, siding with Trump to avoid any appearance of affecting the race. So what what does that mean? Some analysts said that if he had been sentenced before, it could be something akin to an October surprise and helping Trump, who is still somehow winning in leading in some polls, legitimate polls, and it's just 
horrifying to imagine, which is just another reason I'll be here in Nevada and everywhere else to leave everything I can on the field. Thank you so much for your support on this and to the Harris Waltz campaign and Democratic Party, which raised $361 million apparently last month, nearly triple what Trump and Republicans did. And of course, you heard that Liz Cheney has endorsed uh, Kamala Harris and now Dick Cheney has as well. The Republican former vice president said he would vote for Harris and said that Trump tried to steal the last election using lies and violence. But where will George W. Bush do? Apparently, he is not going to endorse anybody because he is the worst and surprises nobody. Finally, I guess I just wanted to mention one more headline. The U.S. labor market continues to slow. The economy added 142,000 jobs last month and earlier job gains were revised downward boosting the Federal Reserve's case for cutting interest rates, which I think is good. Stocks fell on the news, which is unsurprising. And those are the headlines that I gathered for you from the weekend. I'm sure there's a lot more. You can always let me know what you think I should be talking about. Just email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com about that and anything else. Let's get to the sound bites. I've got several for you from the weekend, starting with this hilariously pathetic soundbite from uh, Kimberly Guilfoyle. She experienced a bit of a Jeb Bush moment Saturday night on an event in Florida when she reminded guests at a dinner that they could clap for her in a speech if they felt so inclined. Listen to this cringeworthy 34 seconds from Don Jr.'s girlfriend and the former wife of Gavin Newsom, who is a huge Trump supporter, and it's worth listening to. On a personal note, I can tell you that I am as hopeful as ever. Because Americans from all walks of life have had enough of the Democrats' decline, and we are ready, we are willing, and we are able to spark a new era of American exceptionalism. You can clap for that. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah, I feel like it was worth it. I want to laugh at her with you. And so there you go. All right. Well, James Carville, I don't know why they ask him to come on TV. I don't know why anybody interviews him, but he, he really does get away with saying ridiculous half cocked things. And sometimes they're entertaining and accurate. I thought this was interesting. Here he is talking with Jen Psaki on MSNBC for about a minute and a half yesterday, sitting in front of a bunch of liquor bottles, wearing a beat up hat and a wrinkled shirt, but entertaining as much of an asshole as he is, as always. Here's Carvel on MSNBC yesterday. Appeal to. Who will it impact? If you're the Harris campaign, what do you do with it in the ideal scenario? Well, first of all, the combination of the Cheney, Liz, Vice President Cheney's endorsement and a, a, a bunch of other, I think it's going to give license to some traditional Republicans, probably more fluent areas, you know, uh, but who don't like Trump, they've never voted for a Democrat. Well, OK, I can do this. And it's not going to be a huge number of people, but it, it, it has the potential to be very helpful. I, mean, I can see some of that on the main line. Uh, I can see some of that, you know, in, in parts of uh, Phoenix, you know, critical parts. I can see some of that in Buckhead. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of places where we might lose 63 to 37. We might lose 64. And mm-hmm. you, you're, over a period of time, that accumulates. We know that. The, the, the theory that small changes lead to big results is, is absolutely true. Yeah, and that's I think a ch- that Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I think there are people who say, man, i got to hold my nose. I don't know if I can do this. And, oh, well, damn, Dick Cheney's doing it. I guess I can. And I think that's important. And yeah. he doesn't equivocate. I saw Nikki Haley on another network this morning. Oh, my God. And she was talking about how much she loved Taiwan. And she was just saying, they pointed out that Trump said, well, I don't care about Taiwan. It's 6,500 miles away. Let China do it at once. And then she started talking about Afghanistan. What a... Does that woman have any courage at all? Because if she does, it's not particularly evident to anybody. No, she, she, she's not been, she's not delivered on the courage quotient over the last couple no. of months. I'm going to question like, I don't know if she's I, more spineless or gutless, but one of the two certainly apply to her. Yeah, no doubt. James Carvel, I always love talking to you. Thanks for taking the time. You, really appreciate it. All right. Well, they were talking about Nikki Haley, of course. And here she is yesterday on Face the Nation talking to Margaret Brennan about the sexism of Trump and Vance and basically agreeing, but still supporting them. Hmm. So we know that since Vice President Harris entered the rate, the gap among women voters has grown to a now double digit lead for her over Donald Trump, uh, according to our CBS uh, most recent survey. So. 
How do they close that? Because just as recently as last week, J.D. Vance said he's disoriented and disturbed that the head of the most powerful teachers union in the country doesn't have a single child. He continues to say things that certainly are highlighted as being offensive to women. That is going to hurt, won't it, with female voters? It's not helpful. It's not helpful. I mean, is he a, a, an effective messenger for the policies you say they are stronger on? Well, I think that the policy, look, you can either look at style or you can look at substance. I choose as a voter to look at substance. The style, I What's will say... What's the substance of that, though? The substance is cutting taxes, making housing more affordable, immigration, national security. That's the substance. The style is... No, it is not helpful to talk about whether women have children or whether they don't. It's not helpful to say any of those things that are personality driven or mm -hmm. anything else. I have, I have said that and I will continue to say to Republicans, stop it. That's not helpful. You know, if you want to talk about things, stick with policy. Americans are smart. They don't need all of this other noise to distract them. They just want to know how you're going to help them. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, what I would suggest to every American, Look at the records of each of them. You've got some stark contrast there. You know, Harris was not strong on the border. Trump was strong on the border. Harris wanted to eliminate fracking. Now she's taking that back. But energy production was not as strong as it was under the Trump it's administration. It's high right now, actually. But yeah, um, she corrected her. She fact-checked her. It's at an all-time high right now. How do they get away with that talking point so often? All right, well, let's switch gears and networks. Head over to CNN, where Dana Bash was talking to Pete Buttigieg, who is always great. So I figured I'd grab this for you as a bit of a palate cleanser from having to hear Nikki Haley just then. Here with me now is someone who has debated Kamala Harris on stage, 2020 presidential candidate uh, for the Democratic primary back then. Pete Buttigieg, thank you so much for being here. So there is a new New York Times poll out this morning. And it says 28% of likely voters said they still need to learn more about Harris. Only 9% say that about Trump. What does she need to do at the debate to fill in those blanks? Well, I think the main task will be to make sure Americans understand the difference in visions and are reminded that they already agree with her on the issues that matter most to them. But that's going to be challenging. Uh, I've uh, I competed with her for the Democratic nomination, uh, and I had the honor of being involved in her debate preparations against Mike Pence. Uh, she is a very focused and disciplined leader. Uh, but it will take almost superhuman focus and discipline to deal with Donald Trump in a debate. It's no ordinary ordinary proposition. Uh, not because Donald Trump is a master of explaining policy ideas and how they're going to make people better off. Uh, it's because he's a master of taking any form or format that is on television and turning it into a show that is all about him. Uh, but uh, the less we're talking about him and the more we're talking about you, the better it's going to be for the vice president because she has laid out an agenda things like making sure that our tax code is fair and protecting a woman's right to choose that is, of course, the opposite of Donald Trump's agenda, which has been around tax cuts for the wealthy and his record of destroying the right to choose. Uh, it's, uh, again, an extremely challenging task uh, in the face of all of the distraction, uh, whatever outrageous things he does and says, because they will require a response, and yet you can't allow him to change the subject from the difference between his very unpopular uh, set of policies and record and yeah. her vision for Americans future. Buddha Judge, one of the best surrogates you could possibly ask for on the campaign trail on CNN yesterday. Let's head over to ABC with John Carl. He had the governor of Arkansas, Empty Barrel and Nepo Baby, Sarah Huckabee Sanders on to say, uh, talk about Liz Cheney and how not conservative she is. And I want to torture you with these almost three minutes because I think it's important to hear her sacrificing herself on the mantle that is Trump. These Christian nationalists, these quote conservatives licking the boots of one of the worst people ever. We should all hear this on the record as hard as it is. Well, you heard uh, uh, from Liz Cheney and obviously she's not, not alone among prominent Republicans that are uh, that, that, are, that are supporting Kamala Harris or simply saying that, that Donald Trump is unfit for office. How do you square that that record that you just talked about, which is obviously debatable and will be debated with what happened at the end of, 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 of the Trump presidency, where, you know, he did try to overturn a, a, a presidential election, tried to overturn a Democratic election. I, I do think she actually is significantly in the minority here. You look 
across the board, prominent Republicans are supporting President Trump. But ultimately, I think she's a non-factor. I'm not trying to be rude, but you don't get to call yourself a conservative or Republican when you support the most radical nominee that the Democrats have ever put up. That doesn't make you uh, a conservative. It certainly doesn't make you a Republican. I think it makes you somebody who wants to protect the establishment. Frankly, I don't think this is news. It should come as no shock that Liz Cheney is not supporting the president. But what should come as a shock is that she is trying to call herself a conservative Republican uh, or either one of those two words while supporting somebody who so clearly does not represent conservative principles. Well, well on one specific that, that she pointed out and others have, too, uh, you know, Donald Trump is talking about, you know, widespread tariffs, tariffs on virtually every thing that is imported into the United States, big tariffs. Uh, it's become almost a centerpiece of his economic message right now. How is that conservative? I mean, I've been covering politics for a long time. Conservatives usually don't like taxes, uh, don't like tariffs. Now Trump is talking about them all the time. Uh- Uh, This is a president who uses that as a tool to hold others' feet to the fire. He wants to make sure that we're actually making things in America. There's nothing more conservative than empowering Americans and American companies to build things here versus building them overseas. We have to quit becoming completely dependent and reliant on people who hate us, people like China, people like Russia, people like Iran. We have a president now who has allowed himself to be completely walked all over and a vice president who has been right there by his side, allowing other countries to take the lead. As we move into the next four years and the next administration, we have to decide, who do we want to be the world leaders? Do we want it to be the United States, or do we want it to be our adversaries like China, like Russia? Frankly, I don't want it to be them. I want it to be the United States. And there's only one person and one president and one administration who's done that before and will do it again, and it's Donald Trump. We certainly cannot count on Vice President Harris to build back American strength when she's never demonstrated a a capability of doing that in the past. Okay, thank you very much. You are absolutely terrible and hollow, but that's what we expected. And speaking of the Cheneys, here is Liz Cheney also talking to ABC's Jonathan Carl. Kamala Harris win over Republicans looking for an alternative to Trump. Liz Cheney joins me now for her first television interview in months. Welcome to this week. Thank you. Great to be with you, John. So, Bottom line, why did you make this decision to support Harris and why did you do it now? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I've been uh, voting for 40 years. Uh, My first uh, vote I ever cast was for Ronald Reagan in 1984. Uh, I've never voted for a Democrat. Wow. Um, And uh, it tells you, I think, the stakes in this election. Um, You know, Donald Trump presents a challenge and a threat uh, fundamentally to the republic. Uh, we see it on a daily basis. Uh, somebody who uh, was willing to use violence in order to attempt to seize power, to stay in power. Um, someone who represents uh, unrecoverable uh, catastrophe, frankly, in my view. And um, we have to do everything possible to ensure that he doesn't, uh, he, that he's not reelected. Given how close this race is, uh, in, in my view, again, it's not enough. You have many Republicans out there who are saying, well, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to vote for him, but we will we will write someone else in. Right. And I, I think that this time around, uh, that's not enough, that well, it's important to actually cast a vote uh, for Vice President Harris. I, I want to. All right. There you go. Liz Cheney coming out for Vice President Kamala Harris. Isn't that crazy? Just never thought we would see it. Dick Cheney, too. But still no George W. Bush. All right. Now let's head over to the Meet the Press program on NBC, where Kirsten Welker was talking with the senator from Georgia where this horrific shooting happened last week. It's Raphael Warnock, who I thought was great as always. Well, good morning to you, Senator. Our thoughts are with you and everyone in the state of Georgia after that horrific school shooting this week. Of course, uh, you have been in your position in the wake of other mass shootings as well. What makes this instance unique, though, Senator, is the fact that a father has now been charged after giving his son the weapon that authorities say was used in the mass shooting a year after the father was questioned by the FBI for online threats that his son was making. Do you think that there is any law that could have prevented this tragedy in your state, Senator? 
Well, let me just say that I spent Friday night with the wonderful people of Winder, Georgia. And um, I thought about it as I was sitting there and thought about my own days as a high school student a long time ago. But it was Friday night. We should have been at a high school football game with uh, high school students cheering on their classmates. Instead, they were mourning their classmates and two teachers. Um, look, w we can do better than this. We, we have to begin with the fact that this is a tragic form of American exceptionalism. This doesn't happen all over the world. No, nowhere else where you have a country that's not at war do you have this kind of routine, <clears throat> random violence uh, as just a part of, of the tragic uh, everyday lives of people. And so there are a whole range of things that need to be done. And uh, I find it uh, deep, deeply, deeply uh, frustrating that in the wake of this, we can't bring ourselves, we can't find the will to do what we Americans agree on. And that's a whole range of things. But we have to start with the, the fact that this, this can't continue and that we can fix it. There you go, Raphael Warnock. And I thought that was great. And this is really powerful. This is Tim Walz on the campaign trail with trying out a new line. And man, is he good. He is patient and poised in these speeches. And I'm going to give you one of the most important moments from that over the weekend. Very, very powerful. Think about it in this room. This is what these folks are focusing on, spending all their time. Like reading about two male penguins who love each other is, is somehow going to turn your children gay, and that's what you should worry about. But here's what I'll tell you. It's a fact of life some people are gay. But you know what's not a fact of life? That our children need to be shot dead in schools. That's not a fact of life. Yes, Tim Walz referring, of course, to J.D. Vance uh, saying that these are a fact of life. And, of course, the media scolds are saying that that was taken out of context. I disagree. Uh, we know exactly what the men, more importantly, what they're doing. Donald Trump said we're supposed to get over it. J.D. Vance is saying it's a fact of life. Well, none of that's going to happen. We're not going back. And I am really excited to hear the way that Tim Waltz is talking in that comment and everywhere else doing a great job on the campaign trail. Finally, here is one last soundbite. This is Bernie Sanders. They try to catch him up. Try to uh, on Kamala Harris's record as a progressive over also on NBC with Kirsten Welker. You have described Vice President Kamala Harris as a progressive. She has previously supported Medicare for all. Now uh, she does not. She's previously supported a ban on fracking. Now she does not. These, Senator, are ideas that you have campaigned on. Do you think that she is abandoning her progressive ideals? No, I don't think she's abandoning her ideals. I think she's trying to be pragmatic and doing what she thinks is right in order to win the election. Uh, my own view is, is slightly different. I, I think that in America today, there are a lot of people, rural people, working class people, who no longer believe that the United States Congress and government represents their interests, who are dominated by big money interests. So I think that there is something wrong personally when we are the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all of our people despite spending twice as much per capita. That is why I support Medicare for all. She does not. She has another approach toward moving toward universal health care. But again, I think on issues like expanding Medicare by expanding Social Security and lifting the cap on taxable income that the rich put in so we can raise Social Security benefits, the need to raise the minimum wage from a starvation seven and a quarter minimum wage to a living wage. I think if you campaign on those issues, raising taxes on billionaires, you know what? She's going to win. And I think she could win big. Well, let me just ask you then, big picture. Do you still consider Vice President Kamala Harris to be progressive, Senator? I do. I love that. I do. I love it. Perfect. All right. And also I had Nevada television on yesterday and I saw, you know, being in the swing states, I'm going to pay close attention to everything and share it with you. And here I saw a pro Kamala Harris ad while I was watching a little football on opening week. And then I saw this anti Kamala Harris ad. You kind of need to see it. These ads are very powerful, but they're basically trying to paint her as a liberal that lets bad people go, even though she prosecuted more bad people than you can ever possibly imagine if you look into her record. But this, 
I wanted to share with you, this is not great audio. I taped it off my phone, but this was the ad I saw rolling in the Las Vegas market yesterday. Kamala Harris was the liberal San Francisco prosecutor. She let an MS-13 gang member go, who then murdered a father and his two sons. She agreed to release another felon, who then committed murder. Kamala Harris, a dangerous San Francisco liberal. A dangerous San Francisco liberal. I'm terrified. Oh, as I walk around Nevada in my Harris Waltz gear all week. There you have it. Those are your news headlines and sound bites. I hope you appreciate it. Sorry if the sound wasn't as perfect as always. I'm not in the home studio, but I think it sounds pretty good. Always trying to make it better. Let me know what you're hearing and if there are any errors, silences, or editing issues. Always want to hear about that as well. But now it's time to get to my guest on today's show. Very excited to share this conversation with Steve Bennon with you. He is one of my favorite writers, journalists, and all of political media. His new book is so good. His last book is really, really good and important as well. He's a producer on The Rachel Maddow Show. He's the author of The Maddow Blog, which I reference every day, and he are, publishes several articles a day on that blog. His op-eds have appeared in New York Times, Washington Monthly, where I found him, The American Prospect, and so much more. He's won Emmy Awards. He's been nominated for all kinds of awards for The Rachel Maddow Show, and he's the author of of this new book, The Imposters, How Republicans Quit Governing and Seized American Politics. It's already a national bestseller. He lives in Vermont, lives and works from there. This is such an important book, as was his last one, The Imposters, How Republicans Quit Governing and Seized American Politics. I want to talk with him about that one next time. But right now, it's time to get to Steve Bannon, and I would love if you'd let him know that you heard him here on the show on all social media, including Twitter, because this is hopefully uh, not the last time he joins me. I know he really liked our conversation. I know I did. I hope you do. Let's do it right now with Steve Bannon. Oh, I can't believe it. He is here. Steve Bannon, the great Steve Bannon. I'm so happy to have you. Congratulations on your new book. Everybody must get it. Welcome, sir. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Ministry of Truth, Democracy, Reality and the Republicans War on the Recent Past. Is this hyperbolic or is it Orwellian, in fact, where we are living in? I think it's the latter. I think that there is a war on reality that's underway. I think that there is a war on the integrity of the recent past underway. And I think that there are real consequences to that. I think that it's not just an abstraction. You know, I talked to a lot of folks who read the, read the book or who talked about who heard about the book. And they'll say, yeah, but Trump lies a lot. We, we all know it's just the background noise. And how important is this? And I push back because I think that it, it matters a great deal. I think it affects everything from elections to legislation to even democracy. Because really, when you get right down to it, democracy rests on a foundation of shared knowledge. And when that shared knowledge is compromised, is corrupted by partisans, I think it matters in the real world. And so I don't think it's hyperbolic. I think it's legit. Who would be the minister of truth? That's provocative. I like that. I, I, for your listeners who aren't familiar with Orwell in 1984, the well, whole idea of ministry know of everything truth. about Orwell, Steve. No, <laughs> go ahead. I'm joking. I don't even remember it. Go ahead. <laughs> it's funny you should say you don't remember that because the truth of the matter is a lot of us read it, but it's been a while. We're not, for those of us who aren't in high school or junior high anymore, it's, it's been a few years. In, in, in 1984, there's this authoritarian regime that is the, the, was responsible for, among other things, this, they have this propaganda arm, and Winston Smith is the protagonist of the story, and he works there, and he, he among other things, writes, re, he rewrites history and sends the inconvenient facts down the memory hole. I think that, and while my book is not about Orwell in 1984, it obviously was, the, the title was inspired by this because I think that there are parallels. We're dealing with an environment in which the Republican Party has attacked the integrity of the recent past because it needs to suit its own purposes, and that is where the Ministry of Truth comes from. That is, and So who is the minister... I think for all intents and purposes in the modern Republican Party and the degree to which it's corrupted, I'm going to put Trump in the head spot. (laughs) He's got the job. Okay, so do Democrats compare in any way to the behaviors and techniques that Trump, the MAGA movement, use? I make the case in the book that there are no angels here. I don't think that it's I think that if some of your listeners are thinking, yeah, Democrats will sometimes get away with similar tactics in terms of putting positive spin on things. I'll concede the point. But. Having said that, I think that there's a qualitative difference. I think that when it comes to when it, when it comes to rewriting recent history, there is just no comparison between the two parties. It's not as if it's not as if Barack Obama after the ACA website didn't work said no, it, it worked fine from the beginning. And anyone who says otherwise is just ridiculous and they're lying and not to be trusted. He never he wouldn't even consider that. It would be absurd on its face. 
or similarly, we wouldn't have Hillary Clinton running around saying, no, secretly, I won the 2016 race. Right. You don't know that, but I do. And I have sources. I can't share where they are, who they are. But trust me, it happened. Like, it, she didn't try that because there's no point. It's just not how Democrats work. It's not how they operate. And so with that in mind, I think that it's I think the idea that this is a both sides problem it, that's just absurd on its face. And one difference I find before we get to the specifics of the book is right wing media versus not left wing media, but the rest of media in that right wing media is willing to repeat or defend a Trump lie over and over again, where left wing progressive or middle of what, what the corporate media, whatever people identify it as, they, they won't do that. You couldn't have. Joe Biden go out and lie about something or uh, over and over different things and have the Associated Press or CNN or MSNBC even. I, I think they do. They practice journalistic ethics and they don't do that. So to me, you can't do this. And I know you talk and write about it all the time without the parrots in the right wing media, no matter how embarrassingly absurd it is. And you mentioned that it requires to have no shame to be able to repeat it. I'm really glad you emphasize this because I think it's absolutely integral to understanding the thesis that no one person, no matter how politically powerful, no matter how politically influential, no one person can rewrite history by himself or herself. It's just not possible. He or she will need allies. He or she will need an, a media ecosystem that will support the lies and the scam and this effort to rewrite recent history and put reality up for grabs. That is something that requires a team. And so, yeah, Donald Trump does it, but at the same time, so does his party, so does Fox News, so does conservative radio, so do right-wing websites. And that cooperation between all of these entities is what makes it work. It's what makes the scam possible. So much of what I think and believe is because I've read you for over 10 years almost every day, and you go deep into the day's news controversies and policy, the arguments. You're an objective, great writer and journalist, and you put out as much quality work as anybody in all of political media. And as a result of that, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings around Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, Mitt Romney, even John McCain, in terms of where they were on policy. And you wrote a lot about that in your excellent last book, which I never interviewed you on and hope that I can because it's super relevant and very important. The difference in the point I'm trying to make is Trump changed everything because of the idea of flooding the zone with shit. So when coming back to the Ministry of Truth, which lie, which crazy thing should we look at? Even this past week, Steve, as we're talking, there's so many things. You go to school, your kid goes to school, one gender, he comes back a different gender. We could start there. There's so many other things like that, Arlington, and how that gets rewritten. So when you talk about the recent past, we're talking about the fact that the difference between all those Republicans I mentioned and this Republican, if you will, Trump and his party, is that every week or even every day, there's several things. And how can you possibly, as a journalist or any other resource, push back or debunk or address them? Yeah, I, I was doing a, a show just yet. I was doing a show just yesterday, and they're talking about the timeliness of the book and how it, I, I seem to have timed it perfectly to coincide with with these developments. And, I, and the thing, I, my response to that was, it's always. It's always that if my book came out a month ago or three months ago or two months from now, it doesn't matter because the systemic approach to the recent past is not unique to the, right now. It's not unique literally to today or this week or this month. It is just an ongoing crisis. It's this ongoing attack, this campaign, this war, as I put it in the book. It's something that is, is just become a staple of Republican politics in the 21st century. And yeah, I appreciate the fact that my book seems timely and it is, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, it's not just a, it's not just September, 2024 that we should be thinking about, right? You, you mentioned the Arlington scandal. That was a big one. We, just literally yesterday, we saw this fresh evidence about Russia and influence in the U.S. elections. That's a consistent pattern with when it comes to Russia attacking the 2016, 2018, 2020, and so on elections. And it's because there's a, it's an active campaign underway in the, from the Kremlin to try and influence elections in order to help Donald Trump and his party. And, and yet, in Republican politics, as far as they're concerned, there is no Russia scandal. That's it. It's all just a hoax. It's all been discredited. We don't need to believe it. But we do because not only is it real, it's ongoing. Yeah, you have a, a chapter about it. And yes, it's ongoing. It's crazy. Uh, so you explain that rewriting recent history. And by the way. Steve, I'm old enough to remember 20. I'm 28 days old or 20 some days old. When Donald Trump said at the upcoming DNC, Joe Biden 
was going to come back and take it back, of course, which was hilarious if it wasn't so crazy because he so badly wanted Biden back that he was trying to will it to happen. He thinks he's that powerful. But the point is, he said that. We talked about it. We had to address it to some extent, or maybe we didn't. We can talk about how we should be covering him. But it's just my point of saying every day. I don't know if you want to say anything about that one before I get into your. No, I, mean, I found that hilarious, too. I, I genuinely believe that in Trump's mind that he can just will these things into existence. And I think that is a part of his entire mendacity as it, as it relates to current events is that he thinks I'll just lie. People will believe it. And sometimes those things will come true because I want them to come true. It's painful and it's, a, and it's bewildering. And yet it is the background noise of our civic lives. I think I learned the word mendacious from you when covering it was either you or Greg Sargent when covering. No, it was me. No, don't give credit to Greg. No, right here. <laughs> I, you're absolutely right. Paul Ryan. Was it the mendacity of Paul Ryan? This is like his. No, it was Mitt Romney. It was Mitt Romney. Yeah, yeah, it was, I was chronicling Mitt's mendacity. That's what, that was yours. I so sorry I, to you and Greg. I'm so listen. I'll get back at you. Really, s- such an important word that I learned about dishonesty and lying as it related to Mitt Romney. And you, were, yeah, you did such a good job at that back in the day. Let's get to your current work in this current book. You say that to rewrite recent history, it's built on four pernicious pillars: wholesale indifference toward reality absence of shame, the role of allies, which we discussed, the importance of repetition. Let's just go to the first one. Unpack why there has to be a a wholesale indifference toward reality, including what we already know and what we see with our own eyes and faces. I I think that a lot of your listeners are probably thinking that the efforts to rewrite history are, are that those efforts are not uncommon, and that's true. As long as there have been historical records, there have been people in positions of authority who've been trying to rewrite them. But in general, those attacks tend to refer to generations past. And that happens too in the United States, of course. Right now, we see Republicans going after textbooks, going after the Civil Rights Movement and the Civil War and the Revolutionary War and the Founding Fathers and across the board. All of that is up for grabs, and they find that it's been an important part of their culture war. And the people who are involved in that fight, my heart goes out to you. God bless you. Have a lot. You have a lot of work to do. But what I'm talking about in my book is something I think far more is far more ambitious, which is that they're targeting recent events. They're talking events, talking about events that we experienced and saw and learned from and, and heard and understood from in our own day to day lives. And yet, for them, they believe that they can bully our memories into submission. They would say, "Don't believe your lying eyes. Don't believe your lying ears. Believe Donald Trump. Believe the Republican Party's message." Because even if that it conflates. It conflicts with what you think. It's up for grabs, and what you saw. It, don't believe it. Believe Trump instead. There's so many, so, yeah, they, so many examples of just obfuscating what we saw, what we heard from. I, I, I never said lock her up. What's an example? Where do I begin? <laughs> I, I think from January 6th to the Trump Russia scandal to Trump's first impeachment, the Ukraine scandal, to even the building of the wall. Right now, to this day, Donald Trump continues to campaign saying that A, he finished building the wall. He didn't. And B, if you elect him, he'll finish building the wall, which it con- conflicts with the first part. And it's this wholesale approach to his entire records, entire agenda, his entire vision, which is just as far as he's concerned, susceptible to being rewritten and public is just supposed to play along, even though we know better. You say the second pillar of rewriting recent history is the absence of shame. That's a psychological analysis, Steve Bannon. And it's one that anybody that understands the word gets what you mean. And it is probably the one to me that I think probably bothers me the most about anybody. Don't you care like at all about what people might think? Of what you say or or what you do or what you believe, explain to me what you mean by the absence of shame and why it's an important pillar. I think that it's if, when it comes to communication, political communications, if Republicans were to be in any way sheepish in their selling of these lies and the pulling off of the con, that a pair, the public would see through it. Voters would say, wait a minute, that, that guy doesn't really believe what he's saying. He's trying to pull a fast one. I can see that. But if they if they're faux sincere... And if they just abandon shame altogether and just tell people, no, I, I, I never said you should be dis- injecting people with, people with bleach to, to combat COVID. I never said that. If I said I was kidding, I was just a joke. I, but even though we know better, we, he'll, he'll say it with such sincerity and he'll say it with so many times in order to convince you that maybe his version of reality is true. It's called gaslighting and for a reason. There's, there's a great story about gaslighting from 
when it was a theatrical and a film. And, and it's about trying to make you question your own understanding of reality. And, and so that is this shameless approach and they keep pulling it off and people keep falling for it. It's very frustrating. Very frustrating. And you mentioned the third is the third p- pillar to rewriting recent history is uh, the role of allies. We touched on that in the media, obviously Fox News, but there's just we I think there's sometimes an over focusing on Fox News. Just look at the three guys that are they're saying that Russia paid. I don't know if I believe that they knew it or not, but guys like Tim Poole and Benny Johnson and so many more people on social media uh, uh, that who have podcasts and YouTube shows, much less Elon Musk who is saying things over and over. He's got the most followers on Twitter and he is who he is. What else would you say about the role of allies and who you're referring to? Yeah, I emphasize this point a lot in the book because I feel like it's not just one person. I think that it's easy to think it's just Trump. If Trump loses in 2020 in the fall, then maybe we'll see a different landscape. Yes and no. It's, I think it's important. The, the, the outcome of the election is obviously going to be very important. But when it comes to this larger campaign, it comes to this war in the recent past, I emphasize the role of partners because even if Trump were to lose and exit the stage, which I think is unlikely, but even if he were to lose and exit the stage, we still have the entire Republican Party that's been corrupted on this point. It's not just something that we, we need not think of this as just a single person causing the problem. It's not. It's a larger operation at work. Yeah. And it makes a lot of money and it makes and helps people get elected. All right. That's the, the broad kind of overview of how this happens. I didn't say the importance of repetition. I feel like that's self-explanatory and it's an old school tactic. Obviously, we've all heard this and it works, by the way, not only for pernicious campaigns of pol- politics, but grocery store you go to or how you shop. Repetition is why you could see an advertisement 30 times before you finally go, you know what, I'm going to check that soap out, which is what I always do. And yet I always go back to Irish Spring. Why does repetition matter in this case with the Ministry of Truth? I would ask your listeners to think about how many times have they heard that Donald Trump's economy was the greatest in the history of the world? How many times have they heard that? Even if they don't believe it. Or I guarantee you, they, that's one we're hearing about a lot. It, 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 Donald Trump seems to realize for all of his many faults, he has an understanding of how to pull off a con. He has a, an understanding of how to manipulate people. And so I think that he understands all too well that if he just keeps repeating the lie, shamelessly, without regard for a reality, with the role of partners. If he just keeps repeating it in time, just enough people, the people he cares about most, just enough of them are going to believe it and reward him accordingly. Let's talk about the, it must have been hard to choose which issues you want to talk about, but you write in each chapter here, uh, talk about the Trump-Russia scandal, talk about the 2020 presidential election, of course, the January 6th attack. Trump's Ukraine scandal and the first impeachment, Trump's failed border wall gamble, the federal response to COVID and the Trump era economy. Now, we can't get to all of them in this interview, which is why you what? have. To, can we? I don't know. I didn't ask you how much time you had, but can you? You have to buy the book because each one of these is so detailed because Steve literally writes about this stuff every single day, year after year. And I do want to just uh, talk about the fact that I always give you a hard time publicly when you announce that you're taking a day off, I, I, it's like when people think they're very, they're so important that if they take a day off or the vacation like me, that the world stops. It does. When you take a day off, you should not be allowed time <laughs> off is what I said. And I've got a whole group of people who agree that you should turn into a droid and not have feelings can, or desires. Can I, can I tell you something? I remember the day that I, I took some time off to write this book. And I didn't tell anybody why I was doing it. I didn't tell anybody what the purpose of my time off. I just said I was taking this autumnal break. And you, in particular, gave me such a hard time online. And I remember telling you, I don't know if you remember this, but I tweeted back at you. And I'm like, you know what? You'll be glad later. I'm doing this for a reason. Just trust me. It's all going to work out. And so here we are like nearly a year later. This was why I took that time off. I needed to write the book. I feel bad, but I hope you take it as a compliment because your work is so integral. And there's a lot of people in this game, but you are tops for me. All right. You're, um, you're very kind. So how much more time do you have? For you, whatever you want. OK, so let's I feel like the Trump Russia scandal is yeah. a really interesting one uniquely for you to talk about because Rachel Maddow showed covered this as much as well as anybody else. There's plenty of things to criticize about that show's coverage or anybody else, things that they got wrong. But the emphasis and time that they put on it, I would argue, is mostly right. And yet MSNBC gets tarnished for that. And anybody, forget it, anybody who even talks about it 
gets met with that refrain. Oh, Russia, nothing infuriates me more than that, simply because even if you didn't know anything, do you really think that that Vladimir Putin doesn't want Donald Trump to win last time, much less this time before we even get to talk about what he did. And do you really think that Donald Trump won't work with anybody to get elected so much as he's admitted it before we get into the details? But what do you think is some of the most important points to mention about why Russia went down the rabbit hole in the Ministry of Truth to a lot of Americans, unfortunately? Yeah, I look at this as really one of the most important scandals in American history. And a foreign adversary targeted our own political system and tried to influence the outcome of an American election in order to to elevate their own ally to power like that in itself, that what I just described is an extraordinary thing. You know, it's become something routine to us because we've heard it so many times. That basic core scandal is itself to me just breathtaking. But now we, we, we can move beyond that, even beyond that core foundation. We look at the Robert, the Robert Mueller report. We look at the Senate Intelligence Committee report, or a Senate Intelligence Committee led by Republican majority at the time. Those findings are, remain remain shocking to me. You, we forget everything else about this scandal in terms of the various details. But broad strokes, we know that the Trump campaign sought Russian assistance, received Russian assistance, benefited from Russian assistance, lied about Russian assistance, and then obstructed the investigation once, they, once, this, once officials started looking into all of this. That's just what happened. Like, none of that's contested. No, those are just the plain facts that are available based on these publicly available documents. And so this idea that Russia, Russia has been discredited or it's ridiculous and there's no reason to take it seriously. I mean, reality tells a very different story. And that reality is still unfolding as we saw just yesterday. Yeah, just yesterday with uh, the news that the Department of Justice announced that Russia is trying to interfere. It's such a weird thing, too, that. The FBI Department of Justice makes an announcement about Russia's intentions and then immediately it gets politicized because, listen, the conclusions that we've come to is that, yeah, they're trying to interfere on behalf. They, they like Donald Trump. Oh, you're in the tank for Kamala Harris. No, the, the, <laughs> the evidence is they like Trump and Trump likes them. And there's so much more covid to me is probably, I don't know, the most important issue that you write about here because millions of people died as a result but what are you saying about what Trump and Republicans, these, this Republican Party, tried to do about the truth that we all, this is the best example, we've all at this point probably had COVID, much less knew somebody who died or was really ill of it. So it's a hard thing to make us forget about, Steve. One would think, certainly while it was happening, I remember thinking there's no way they're going to be able to rewrite this story. It's just too dramatic. I mean, Trump sidelining scientists and promoting crack cures and talking about injecting people with bleach and politicizing the FDA and the CDC. And there's just no way to rewrite that story. I naively thought at the time because the facts were just, were not just evident, they were painful. They were our daily, day-to-day lives that we all experienced and suffered through. And so it seemed impossible to me that this story could be rewritten. And yet to this day, literally this week, Donald Trump was whining on, on the public, on the campaign trail in the interviews he just doesn't feel like he's getting enough credit for this a fantastic job he did dealing with the federal crisis, the federal response to the COVID crisis. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's breathtaking in its scope because the consequences were so severe. There's no way in the world anyone could look at that, that response as, as a success as, or anything but a failure, a catastrophic failure in itself. And yet Donald Trump not, not only believes that he was great, but he wants credit for his failure. It's, it, it's something I document, obviously, very thoroughly in the book, but there's no reason for them to get away with this rewriting of history. Yes, because we could have another pandemic. We could have another public health issue that needs to be addressed. And it's really important that people understand the utility of public health professionals and agencies. And so many of them were so demonized and hard to imagine them ever recovering. And they, they paint government, as you talked about in your last book and your work. As the problem, not the solution, obviously, that started with Reagan. But the idea that so many people, experts and institutions have been damaged by the Ministry of Truth. It was Trump. It could be again. It's hard to imagine how see how that damage can be undone, Steve. Yes, that that is true. Obviously, your reputation, the, the, no matter who you are, Fauci or my friend Peter Hotez or even the CDC. The recovery process is a long one. The, 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 the scope of the damage was serious and, and long lasting. But having said that, I think that we're starting the last three and a half years. We're starting to see we saw a White House that is taking science seriously, that's taking public health officials seriously, that's doing the hard work that that needs to happen. And the recovery process is not overnight. It's not as if 
Biden's inauguration day, everything gets better. It's not that simple. But we, I think there has been progress on that front. And I have every reason to think that if Donald Trump were to lose in the fall, we'd continue to see additional progress along those lines. Yeah, I'm glad and, to hear you say that. Yeah. Now, we talked about Russia and COVID. The other one that's tangible that you can hold or see or even touch is a wall. If a wall was built or if, a, if you live in your house and your partner was like, hey, you need to fix that wall, even if it wasn't a wall, so you would just fix a wall. And then you'd be like, all right, I'll fix it. And then you say to your partner, I fixed it. And then your partner's <laughs> like, that's still a whole wall. The hole in it. You didn't touch it. That is one of the chapters. Trump's failed border wall gamble. Well, how do they obfuscate this one? How do they tell a different tale here? It's a wall. I th- we talk when we think about why they do this. Like, what is the motivation behind this effort to rewrite recent history? I think this one is my one of my favorite chapters, if not my very favorite chapter, mm. because for, for Trump, the, they would, the wall, this border wall, was a signature issue. It was a defining part of his campaign. Yeah. It was the one thing that he cared about more than anything else. He would a vote for him is a vote for a border wall. So A equals B. That's all that you need to know in 2016. And he failed. It was an obvious failure. He, he was able to extend barriers by a few dozen miles. Those barriers were not well made because they were easily compromised by smugglers. And he failed in every possible way to fulfill his campaign promise. Mexico didn't pay for any of it. They weren't made of concrete. They weren't 10 feet tall. So on, so on. The details are, are, are well documented. But the failure here is not just an embarrassment. It undermines the whole core, the whole core of Trumpness. It is so definitional, he can't justify the failure in any other way, but he accepts to rewrite it. He has no choice because otherwise he couldn't have run for a second term. He couldn't run for, he couldn't be running now because the failure was just so obvious. And so when we think about why does he do this, I think he feels like he has no choice because the reality is just so humiliating. It's just so deeply embarrassing that if if left alone, he would lose 50 states. (laughs) What about the economy? How is the Trump economy? We always have to do. We always have to talk about COVID. I think you have to be fair in no matter if you're talking about any four year period, any president's effect on the economy. And we always give undue effort. I'm sure I've learned a lot about that from you. But what did Trump's ridiculous claim of having presided over the greatest economy in the history of the world? Is that not right? It, it's not right. Uh, <laughs> it may surprise people to learn that it is not even close to being right. Of, of the last three presidents in terms of economic performance, he ranks third. And so the idea that human eyes have never before seen an economy like the one that Donald Trump produced is, is just demonstrably wrong. It, I think that I emphasize this a lot because it's more than just a curiosity. If, if Donald Trump's record which, on the economy were taken at face value in terms of the factual details, he would not be able to run right now. He wouldn't have won the nomination because he simply didn't do what he said he would do on 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 the economy, on economic growth. He made all kinds of bold promises about the GDP growth. He didn't meet any of those goals on job creation. He said he'd be God's gift to job creation. His exact words. And yet, in the first three years forget COVID. First three years of, of Trump's economy, of Trump's presidency, job growth went down compared to the last three years of Obama's presidency. How does he justify that? He pretends it didn't happen. That's how he justifies it. And I'll I'll concede the point that the economy was fine for the first three years, but it wasn't record breaking. It wasn't extraordinary. It it was a continuation of the last three years of the Obama era, which is which was a healthy economy. But this idea that somehow he he broke every record and he he exceeded expectations in every possible way. And it's there are factual details here provided by his own administration. And those factual details prove his story wrong. I've always get outraged when, and we heard this a lot from Mitt Romney, you didn't build that. I've always gotten outraged when people say that government doesn't, can't, or shouldn't create jobs. They do, and they should. Not all the jobs, but they have, and that's the way the world works everywhere, always, uh, that has a government. And certainly in the American government, Trump is a builder. He was supposed to rebuild or invest in infrastructure. He didn't. He failed. He couldn't get it done. To me, that's the biggest uh, mistake or failure of his term 
in terms of economics, yet Biden comes in and makes the biggest investment into American infrastructure, energy grid and everything around trans moving to new. That's Joe Biden, who's been in government his whole life, gets buildings made where the guy who was supposed to build buildings failed. To me, that's his biggest economic failure. And I think that in the coming weeks, in the coming days and weeks and you know, a couple of months left in the election cycle, I guarantee you we will hear Donald Trump take credit for that. Yes, I think exactly. that it is. It is inevitable yes. that Donald Trump will say, oh, yeah, I had, I had a great infrastructure record. And I, I signed a big infrastructure bill. And anyone who tells you otherwise, is, that's what's going to happen, because that's his approach to reality. In chapter four, you write about Trump's Ukraine scandal and first impeachment. And we might need a little bit of a reminder of this. But to me, it was one of the most outrageous things that he or any president had ever done, where he reached out to a foreign nation, friend or foe, and said, look into this American who is the former vice president, former senator, investigate him, find me. I need, just say you're invest. just don't even investigate, just say you're investigating him. And then he called it a perfect call as you write about it. I just talked with Jason Stanley, who's an expert. He's a linguist and obviously an expert in fascism and authoritarianism. And he talks about language and how much it matters. And I feel like this is probably one of the quintessential examples to prove the point that you're making, the thesis of the book, which is it, he called it a perfect call and he said it over and over again. But it was, as I just tried to explain, and you can do better, a terrible, illegal, corrupt call. And it put everybody in a bad spot that was around him, much less in Ukraine. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you just you summarized it really well. I just had one detail that, that he didn't just reach out to this ally abroad. He extorted the ally abroad. He said, oh, yes, I have these weapons over here that you really want, and, and I'd love to give them to you, but I need you to do me a favor. Right. And that favor is I want you to help me cheat. I have this election coming up, <laughs> and once you help me cheat, right. then, sure, these weapons will be right on their way. But before then, let's just work something out between you and me. Now, the, it was his own White House that released a, a transcript of that, phone, of that co- phone conversation, that phone meeting, and that documents – from the Trump White House, exactly what happened. And so for him to turn around after that, I say it was a perfect phone call, a, a phrase he repeats constantly, uh, for the, not just in the immediate aftermath, but even to this day. It, it, for him to do that, it, 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 it is, again, this bullying our memories into submission. We know better. We all saw it. We all experienced it. And he's going to say, and he tells us, no, I need you to su- replace the, your version of reality with this alternate reality, one in which my phone call was perfect. But it wasn't. We know better. We know better because of the information that we got from the Trump White House. And so to this day that they're continuing to be right. In fact, and it's not just Trump. In Congress, we see Elise Stefanik and, and Marjorie Taylor Greene introduce these resolutions to undo the impeachment, to undo what we saw happen. They're going to exonerate Trump by way of pretending the impeachment never happened. We're not, they're going to have this resolution undo it. And I have every reason to believe that if there was a Republican majority in Congress next year, working with a Republican White House, that they would, they would, there's no reason to think they wouldn't try and pass that, where they would just undo it. They would just erase it from the congressional record altogether, altogether because it's important in their world to replace our reality with theirs. Isn't it weird when you think of a joke that you then realize might it, it could not be a joke, it could actually happen? Because when you said the, these two congressmen are trying to undo the impeachment, it made me think they if he asked them to, they would try to undo his second marriage that he's still paying for. And it's a joke. And then you're like, would they? And the answer is yes. Yes, they would. Yeah. I, my, my, my heart weeps for satirists and comedians. Yeah. And I, <laughs> because there is no limit there. There is no ceiling here where you're like, no, they, they wouldn't possibly do that. No. Yeah, they would do that. They would, uh, <laughs> including and most egregiously, perhaps it's hard to describe each one of these issues that you talk about because they're all so horrific and bad and terrible and dishonest. But the 2020 presidential election, which leads to January 6th, and you have chapters about each of these events. I sometimes think about if I'm arguing with someone who doesn't believe the truth about the election, which of course we all saw and witnessed. uh, I say there were like, how many trials, how many challenges went to, to courts, all the courts and all of them were thrown out and they were decided by Trump judges and juries. And they just didn't have the arguments, which one of those trials which one of those arguments you want to unpack? And they will still try to defend it. But the bottom line is the 2020 presidential election. The reason why, Steve, I think that's so pernicious is because it, it, like many other things you read about, created a template, which is why in my town, Clarkstown, New York, the right wing fascists in my town were able to convince everybody, most people, most voters 
that trans kids that, that, that the board made a law that allowed trans kids to use bathrooms. New York state made that law. It was easily uh, something that you could argue and point to, but they, they won the election, Steve. So in my town, that was the big lie in towns all across America. People are going to microphones and posting on Facebook, massive, blatant, bold faced lies, and they are getting traction and winning elections. So I just want to insert my own example of how the 2020 presidential election, that big lie it's playing out all over America. So talk to me about how the big lie has played out across the country in local municipalities like mine, much less what it did to make people think that uh, the, the, the lie about the election. Can you use the word template a, short, a minute ago? And I think that was absolutely critical. I, I, I couldn't agree more because I think that Republicans at every level of government, from local to state to federal, they've all come to realize that Donald Trump has created a model. And it's this systemic approach that they can emulate in their own tactics, in their own fights, in their own campaigns, in their own policy disputes. They can just simply look to this example, follow his lead, and, and use the same pernicious pillars we talked about earlier in the show. They can deny reality. They can be they can be working with allies. They can use repetition. They can abandon shame, and then they can win too. And so, I it's I think when, it's, when we think about the consequences of this war in the recent past. It's important to realize that it's not just Trump. It's something that we're seeing over and over again at every level because they look, they're looking at this as a model worthy of emulation. Yes, exactly. Or, or even that going back to shame that it could work. Like, right. I, I, I'm always almost impressed when the lie gets told. No one's going to believe that. Oh, my gosh. They're doing exactly what Steve Bannon wrote about. And now people are believing it like and finally January 6th, where we were told that cops weren't attacked. We watched the video. It is burnt into our minds. We've met and heard from the police officers and their families. Their lives, in many cases, are ruined, broken. We saw what happened. How have they and what have they done around the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol? Of course, inspired by a lie. All those people went up there for a lie. Right. It, it's, I, I think that there's, there are a few more dramatic examples on this because we saw the truth play out on our television screens. We know exactly what happened because it was filmed. In many cases, it was filmed by the rioters themselves. And so we know what exactly what happened. And we know it was not a normal tourist visit. We know that it was not a situation in which the cops were letting in rioters into the Capitol building. We know it was, we, we know for a fact exactly what happened. Not only because it was documented on film, but January 6th committee, bipartisan committee, investigated it thoroughly and told us all the truth. And yet, because of the, the seriousness of this assault on democracy and this assault on the Capitol, Donald Trump and his party real, came to realize that if they had, were going to succeed politically like and electorally, they had to rewrite that story true because the truth was so damaging to them. It was so catastrophic for them that they felt as if that was the story that needed to be retold too. And so they launched their own counter investigation. And Donald Trump is offering pardons and money and, and welcoming these rioters and their families and their lawyers to Mar-a-Lago and Bedminster for fundraisers. Yeah. They're looking at this now as if the, the, the bad guys were the good guys and the good guys were the bad guys. And it's bewildering, but at the same time, it's very much in keeping with this larger pattern. Their assault on reality, they're working with their allies, they're repeating the lies. They're, it's, it's January 6th. Is ex- it, the, the rewriting of that history is exactly what we're seeing in terms of this template that you described a minute ago. It's, a, it's the same model, even though we know better, even though we all saw with our own eyes exactly what happened. Yeah. Last thing I guess I want to ask you just made me think of it. How do you, Steve Bennon, who wrote about Republicans for over the last 10 years when President Obama was in office and obviously saw their text, how do you think of Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney and other Republicans who spoke out against Trump, who investigated January 6th in in the case of the last two. How do you see them knowing about what they did and said and lied about, in my mind, during the Obama administration and including during the Biden administration? All those faux investigations like Benghazi and so on, they were behind all those. I have a hard time uh, forgiving and forgetting and, and, and giving them the credit that a lot of people are giving. I think you're a better person than me and probably more <laughs> mature and moral. But I do wonder, given your reporting on them and what they did then, how you see their them coming to save democracy now. 
I take your point. It, it is absolutely critical to recognize the fact that people like Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney have long records, and you can't just erase those records because they've come to realize that Donald Trump is corrupt and dangerous. But it is important to, to look at them in their totality. And when it wasn't, we, I, I've written about this as when Adam Kinzinger w- was running and, and first came to Congress, he was a Tea Party champion. And so how does one forget that? Or, or how does one overlook that? It's difficult, of course. Liz Cheney voted with the Trump White House on policy measures more often than Freedom Caucus members. It's not as if these members are somehow moderate. They're not. They're, they're very conservative Republicans. Having said that, I, I give Republicans who are able, who had the courage and wherewithal to break with Trump and Trumpism at a degree of credit because so few have. They stand out because we're dealing with a, a party right now that with, with filled with members who know better, but who lack the courage to do the right thing. And so the, the fact that Kinzinger and Cheney, among others, they're the most two, most notable examples, but there are others. Who, who, they're willing to say, you know what, I'm conservative, I'm Republican, but I, I'm not prepared to go down that road. The mega road is too dangerous. I draw the line. I'm not going there. I give them credit for that because even though I disagree with them on so many things, for the, their willingness to, to in, the sake, in the name of democracy, to say, you know what, right. I, I, I draw the line here and no further, I, I give them some credit for that. And the fact that they're endorsing the Democratic presidential candidate, the presidential ticket, I, I think it speaks to this larger patriotism that they're saying, I, I disagree with Kamala Harris, but at the same time, I, it's too important. Uh, we have to vote Trump out. We have to, pardon me, we have to defeat Trump. And so I'm going to vote for Harris. I think that I take your point, but at the same time, I give them credit for doing what needs to be done at a time when it needs to happen. The only thing I would disagree with is the category of people that you discussed that you said they know better, but they lack of courage. I think that if they know better, it's not that they lack courage. It's that they're bad people. They're greedy. <laughs> they're insidious. They're fascist. If Then they should do better. But some of them don't. Some of them are totally brainwashed, obviously cultists, I would imagine. But those who don't. Well, I, I think that there is a faction within Republican politics made up of a lot of people who know better. And some of them are true believers, some of them are true believers who just go along for partisan purposes. But I think that there are some who are black courage. And I think to your point, some of them are just bad people. And yeah. so I, I think that it's one corrupt family and, and there are factions within the family. I, it's such a treat to talk to you because I read you every day and have for over a decade. You are an American treasure and anybody who is not reading Steve Bannon at Maddow blog, no matter what you think of corporate media or MSNBC or Rachel Maddow, doesn't matter. Just put it, stop it with the nonsense. Go read Steve because he's not impacted by the network or the show. I'm sure I don't even have to ask you. I'm sure you have full editorial control over what you post. And I think that's why they brought you in because you were so good at Washington Monthly that, that you were such a value over there that they wanted to bring you over here. So if, if you're not reading him regularly and using his work as a cheat sheet for your show, like I do start now, get the book. And I hope to talk to you about your last book, which I didn't get to as well. Thank you so much, my friend. Really appreciate it. No, I think my thanks to you. You're very generous with your praise. And I want you to know it means a lot to me and I will look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. Well, there you go, Steve Bannon, everybody. Go get the book. Go get both of his books and read him at the Maddow blog. Follow him and let him know that you heard him here on the show. That is show one from Nevada in always worried about how it's going to go with my gear and hopefully I can record okay and it sounds okay and I don't have any problem pulling clips. But today was pretty smooth. Tomorrow, hopefully, I've got some more Nevada-based stuff for you. I'm certainly going to have a lot of experiences. I'm on the phone with a whole bunch of people, and I'm going to get out there and do all I can to turn out the vote, get out the vote here in Nevada and the rest of the swing states. Can't do it without you. And you're never alone if you're part of the stand-up community. You can always check in on us on Discord. And I'll see you at tomorrow night's watch party for the big debate, I hope. 8.30 tomorrow night. Look for that email and link. That's all I've got for you. John Carroll writes all the music. He is also a Grammy Award winner, and you should go buy it. JohnCarroll.org. Can't do it without him. Can't do it without you. Love you guys, and I'll talk to you tomorrow from Nevada. On your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, or you
a bit of scandal. Show your face with every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. She's the place where every lost child will finally be found. There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground, and that's stand up. The seed of that experiment. If you stand up, stand all right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up, and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be told up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand up 